Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Building a Profitable Healthcare IT Company. My name is Gargano Rungacheva. I'm the chairperson for MIT Enterprise Forum. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. During the webinar, all participants will be muted. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the chat box on your Zoom control panel. Our presenter will address questions at the end of the presentation. The webinar is recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel for future viewing. Again, thank you for being here today and for your attention. And I'd like to thank our sponsors as well for making this webinar possible. Now, without further ado, I will turn this over to our host today, Alan Mendelson. Alan? Thank you, Gargana. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a sp special pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, my friend, Eric Rosso. I have known Eric for some 15 years now. And over that time, we've watched him succeed in a number of businesses and not-for-profit endeavors. Eric is currently the CEO of Diameter Health. Diameter solves one of the big problems in healthcare IT today, the lack of compatibility of data streams from different sources. In just six years, the company has grown from two to 86 employees and has seen its revenues double every year for the last several years. Eric is a Connecticut native and graduated from Trinity College with a degree in mechanical engineering. After Trinity, Eric earned an MS in biomedical engineering from the Rensselaer Graduate Center in Hartford and then joined Hartford Hospital as the director of biomedical engineering. Eric stayed at Hartford Hospital for about 12 years. Eric is clearly a talented engineer is primarily evidenced by his work at Hartford Hospital and his deep involvement in the development of the technology of the two companies he co-founded. In addition, he has authored more than 50 academic papers, a textbook on virtual bioinstrumentation instrumentation, and several book chapters. He also has several patents in his name. Eric co-founded with a fellow Trinity classmate, his first company, President Premise Development in 2000. Premise developed software to improve patient flow information, primarily in a hospital setting. Eric was chairman and CEO of Premise until it was sold to Eclipsis on December 31st, 2008 for 40 million. Since only 7 million was invested in the company, everyone got a very nice return. As many of you may recall, December 2008, was near the peak of the market and it crashed soon thereafter. The fact that Eric sold when he did is a testament to his good judgment and intuition. After Premise was sold, Eric stayed on for several years with Eclipsis as the vice president and general manager of the patient flow in business. At Diameter, Eric has built a high performance organization. He is a strong leader who cares deeply about his employees and welcomes input from them, both positive and negative. He is exceptional at hiring, motivating, and retiring, retaining top talent. He works in a collaborative way and makes sure every employee knows the company's and his or her individual goals and objectives. Basically, I would say people like working for Eric. Despite his heavy workload, Eric has also found time to give back to his community. As one example out of many, he has been on the Trinity Engineering Advisory Council forever and has been chair of it for the last several years. My prediction is that under Eric's leadership, Diameter will be a big financial and jobs winner for its employees, its investors, and the state of Connecticut. So without further ado, I now turn the screen over to Eric, who will tell us how he is building Diameter and some of the important lessons he has learned over his entrepreneurial career. Eric? Well, thank you very much, Alan. And let me go ahead and find how to turn on my screen here. You'd think a computer guy would know how to do this on the fly. Even though we practiced it about five minutes ago. OK, there it goes. Too many windows. OK, hopefully, can you see the, the screen OK? Yes. Okay, great. Well, Alan, that was, I think, the longest uh, introduction I've ever had. And um, thank you for the opportunity 
to uh, to present and thank everyone for carving time out of their day to uh, to hear a little bit about our journey. And uh, just really it was kind of enjoyable pulling it together and, and called it, you know, reflections on building healthcare IT companies right here in the state of Connecticut. Um, so what I wanted to cover in, in fairly rapid fashion with leaving time for Q&A and, and, and interaction is just to share some of the influences and opportunities that kind of brought me to this point today. Uh, Alan mentioned Trinity, which we have in common, was a big part of my influence, but it, everything since then has been as well. And it's certainly not a linear drive uh, in building a company. So I wanted to share some lessons learned, uh, some book recommendations, if nothing else, and maybe some parallel reflections on how history can be a teacher to what we're trying to do today and going forward. Um, so I do believe though, and I'm always reticent when Alan talks about me, everything I'm gonna talk about is absolutely a team sport. And uh, that's gonna be a key theme uh, throughout my presentation, because it's true. So I was fortunate to have attended Trinity College uh, right here in Connecticut uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and sometimes I think I reflect more on my time being part of the crew team than being an engineering student. But through that, really came to appreciate the, the importance of culture, of teamwork, focus, commitment, trusting everyone in your boat, um, and also empowering them to play to their strengths and, and have a strategy as an aligned crew and to share it together and to celebrate both the successes and the challenges. So book recommendation number one, some of you may have already heard or read this book, but uh, it's a fantastic book that came out a few years ago called The Boys in the Boat. And it profiles a number of different characters and it's a true book about the University of Washington crew that at that time, the winning national champion went on to represent the US in the Olympic games. And then 1936, they did just that and won the gold medal. But it also profiles a very renowned boat builder named George Pocock. And one of the quotes he said that I gravitated to years ago was, the way power is applied is more important than how much power is applied. And I, I've tried to embark that in my own races and crews that I've coached and also with my company and that trying to be nimble, capital efficient, focused can allow a smaller company to actually win big opportunities and, 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 and take on much larger competitors. I also have to give credit to a, a former uh, professor at engineering uh, named Gus Sopega, uh, who passed away several years ago. Gus is the second one from the left, and that's a much younger Eric, but um, with less gray hair, no gray hair. But one of the visionary things that Gus had was uh, an eye for the future and an eye for technology. And he was at a conference in Austin, Texas, circa 1984, where he came across a, a company that spun out of a University of Texas at Austin called National Instruments, uh, now known as NI. And one of the things that they pioneered is this concept of virtual instrumentation and in effect taking computers through software and creating real world instruments that could have the same look, feel, function, but even more power by being inside a computer um, directly. And I was just fascinated by this metaphor change, this paradigm change, and also reading books around entrepreneurship. Um, and there's a gentleman who used to be the Apple evangelist named Guy Kawasaki, and he's written several books, one of which as you see here called Rules for Revolutionaries, book recommendation number two. And he coined a term called evangineer. And I love this definition. And he defined it as a combination of an evangelist and an engineer, somebody who wants to change the world, but also has a technical knowledge to do it. He called it the ideal revolutionary. And so I love that definition. I love the fact that I had a technical background to build teams to help do that and to try and become an evangineers. Uh, as Alan mentioned, I then went on after Trinity and worked in clinical engineering, biomedical engineering at both St. Francis and later Hartford Hospital. And during that time, really had a great opportunity to be immersed in tremendous um, applications of technology, brilliant physicians, administrators, technology vendors, and really seeing the convergence of real world medical devices with information technology. I also had the uh, good fortune back in high school, I actually grew up in West Hartford, went to Hall High, uh, became very good friends by becoming a, a science partner in our junior year with Joe Adam, who is the co-founder of Premise. Uh, and Joe may even be on this call this afternoon. But here's some other pictures of Joe and I with our outdated Macs circa 1990 something. Um, and that was our first, our first uh, head office in Joe's dining room where we went on to build some shrink wrap software with National Instruments focused on the life science arena. From there, we applied this virtual instrument technology into a number of different applications for cardiovascular research, for environmental cleanup, but ultimately evolved from more of a consulting firm to a product-focused company 
And we were squarely focused on what we called patient flow optimization or helping to streamline patients through a health system, um, much like an air traffic control tower, if you will, for patients coming into a hospital. And again, applying engineering principles, first thing we did was map out what is the patient flow processes, where are the handoffs of information, who needs to touch that? Because in the old days, Placing a patient to a bed may sound like a straightforward initiative, but it often took eight, 10 or more phone calls at that time to do it. And so we felt there could be a better way. We also took pictures of how some of our clients were managing patient flow or bed boards back in 1997, 1998, actually 2000 um, through 2005. And you can see they had these mechanical bed boards with pink and blue cards and folders and it was, it works, but it certainly wasn't scalable and it certainly didn't share information across analog paper cards. So with that, we designed, and one of our early clients was the Cleveland Clinic. This is a picture of their bed control center, uh, circa 2005, um, where we put up a real-time, what we called uh, a hospital um, vital signs dashboard of the hospital's patient flow metrics. And we also created an electronic bed board that could show on the fly, different rooms, different beds, status, occupied, unoccupied, male, female, being clean, dirty, um, isolation, things of that nature. And it was really matching the bed criteria with the patient criteria that was so exciting about finding a bed where a patient might need a cardiac monitor or a negative pressure room or a specialized set of uh, conditions for that environment. And this is just another shot of how we helped hospitals have better visualization of what was happening and what was coming in. Um, we also had real-time floor displays that showed each floor laid out in its geographical format. Pretty common today in a world of Waze and Google Maps and Apple Maps, but back then this was somewhat novel and much more intuitive for the clinician <clears throat> to see who's in what bed and when they're coming up and when the beds are getting cleaned and turned over. Um, and so turnover was a big part of that in terms of housekeeping and transportation and again dashboards to provide that that visibility. But the, the takeaway is applying an engineering set of principles, building a team, being focused, and solving a problem. It wasn't just a problem at Hartford Hospital at the time, but we were able to scale across many of the, the country's um, top health systems and even internationally with the likes of Singapore General uh, and the UK and Australia. So as Alan mentioned, uh, on New Year's Eve 2008, while the ball was falling, um, we actually decided that it made sense to transact and become part of what was a leading publicly traded healthcare IT company called Eclipsis. Uh, and so Eclipsis uh, amiably and like, swallowed us up, so to speak, but we became part of that, became their patient flow solution to round out their portfolio. And actually within 18 months of that, uh, Allscripts, which is still a publicly traded healthcare IT company today, really merged with, but essentially acquired Eclipsis. So that was chapter number one and uh, learned a lot, got a lot of scar tissues from that, but also really met some wonderful people, um, many of whom I'm, I'm still close with and, and some of whom are still working with me today. So the journey continues and trying to take a broader view on, on sort of impact at, at, at a broader level of global health and, and national healthcare. And this isn't directly related to what we do, but I just thought it was important. I was asked to give a talk about a year and a half ago, right before COVID, with um, my roots of the American College of Clinical Engineering in Rome. And, and it inspired me to think about more global things around health and today's consumers. But I just wanted to share, I, I think it's fascinating to realize that when you look at what goes into our health, only 20% of that in the bottom is really attributed to what happens in a healthcare system. Over 50% is tied to socioeconomic factors, the physical environment, what many people call social determinants of health today, uh, as well as your health behaviors and risk factors. And with that, and being inspired by going to Rome and had to go to Florence, which I'd never been to, um, I always wanted to see Michelangelo's David. And I can't take credit for this analogy because I saw it in a talk, but it really resonated with me. And so uh, I heard a, a, a physician once refer to today's population as Hondas and Teslas. And in a moment, it'll be clear what those two are. This is a Honda. Um, Historically, Hondas are, are today's David, you know, hypertensive, obese, not always compliant, often diabetic and adult. And when you think of this demographic change of, of the population that we serve in where things are headed from healthcare, from technology enabled, the Teslas are tech enabled, exercise, self-motivated, living better, active, highly metric oriented, 
population. So how can we embrace this technological environment to improve healthcare overall and, and move more from the Hondas to the, to the Teslas? Part of that is really tied to the internet of things and how connected we all are. And you know, when you think about it, the internet really isn't that old. Um, well, it's been around for 40 years. We as end users have really only been using it for a relatively short span of about 20 years. And you know, the first look at the internet of things, I think can be attributed back to Nikola Tesla himself. In 1926, he commented in Collier's, he quoted to say, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain, which is in fact is of all things, particles and real and rhythmic whole. Uh, the instruments, uh, though they shall be able to do this will be amazingly simple compared with our present telephone. A man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket. It was a comment like that that got him laughed at in some circles back in 1926, but one which was remarkably accurate considering the state of computing at that time and how connected we are today. So with that connectivity though comes a ton of data and I'm reminded of the rhyme of the instant mariner, water, water everywhere, nor a drop to drink. I think the same can be said of clinical data uh, today in healthcare. And while some might argue it's not big data, I would argue that medicine really is big data when you consider there's over 7,000 different codes um, for lab systems, over 140,000 codes for diagnoses, 300,000 different concepts, over a million different medications that have been codified. And when you look at the semantic relationships among them all, you have over 10 million different types of relationships. So, you know, with that, we have a very fragmented healthcare system where, you know, several years ago, our country invested over $30 billion to adopt um, electronic health records. And when I say fragmented, if we think of the population today, thinking back to those, those Hondas, you know, 40% of patients today, of Medicare patients, have seven or more different chronic conditions. They often see 11 or more different physicians in different settings across multiple practices. And even the electronic health records themselves are still quite fragmented, where the top 20 collectively only have around 70% of a uh -huh. fragmented market. So it's no surprise that when you think of the end users, the clinicians on the front line, they're overwhelmed with data and not just too much data, but dirty data. Um, I love some of these quotes where a physician once said, you know, if you give me a 70 page summary, it's probably 68 pages too long. Or if I get seven documents from my health information exchange, I look at zero of them. Or another CEO simply said, the biggest challenge we have is just badly behaving data. So if I can diverge a little bit, thinking about history and interoperability, it's not the first time we've tried to create interoperability. And if we look back to circa 1857, there was this crazy but really ambitious entrepreneur came out of Stockbridge, Mass. His name was Cyrus West Field. And only a decade earlier, the telegraph had been invented to transmit messages virtually and instantly. And, and he was just blown away by it. He was a man on a mission. And with the backing of what was then the American and British governments and one of their suborganizations, he created the Atlantic Telegraph Company to do something that had never been done before. And that is to lay a telegraph wire on the bed of the Atlantic Ocean to connect Europe with the New World. And in 1857, he made four attempts and each of them failed to lay the cable. He nearly sank in one of his ships um, a former warship called the uh, Agamemnon during a storm, and, and he was pretty disheartened. But then in 1858, he uh. did it, and he had to splice both ends, and it was a really exciting moment, um, and three weeks later, it failed. And it wasn't until um, really several years later, eight years later, that, that he was able to do it, and it was really exciting, and that was really the first permanent transatlantic telegraph um, and he was eventually awarded a gold medal by the US Congress for his work. So if you were to permit me to indulge in some theoretical history, at the time Andrew Johnson was president and Louis Bonaparte, um, Napoleon Bonaparte III, who was the nephew of, of the Napoleon I, um, was the King of France. And if they were to have communicated with each other, it would have looked like this. And, and you know, Johnson would have said, you speak English, to which he would have heard in French, I do not speak English. And so, this helps illustrate what do we mean by interoperability and semantic interoperability. They could hear each other, but they could not understand what each other was saying. And that is really why this company, Diameter Health, was founded, what its mission is, um, and it's really to be the de facto standard for optimizing health data 
to empower this broad ecosystem by making data universally accessible, organized, and actionable. So in terms of the company, uh, we're super proud to um, have a, an amazing syndicate. And I want to make a call out, especially to Connecticut Innovations. I think we've got a few folks from CI in the call. This is my second company that CI has supported and backed, and it's just been great working with them and, and with Matt Storygard in particular um, on our board. Uh, we're also very proud to have um, tier one investors, including Centene, Optum Ventures, LRV Health out of Boston, um, Activate Venture Partners, which used to be called Milestone Venture Partners, and uh, Accelerate Health Ventures down in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we do have our headquarters here in Connecticut and Farmington. I'll talk in a moment about how we've expanded to a multi-market presence. Um, we are SaaS based, and as Alan said, we're actually over 85 employees this week. Over a three, three series of capital raises, we've raised now in total uh, $30 million, our most recent round being this past September, uh, and an $18 million Series B that was led by Centene. But the vision is nothing new. And in fact, there's this wonderful YouTube video, which I have the link here at the bottom, by uh, Professor Larry Weed, who gave a Grand Rounds lecture way back in 1971. And many of the problems he highlighted then are just as true today. When you think of healthcare being a fifth of the US GDP, how complex medicine is, not to distill it, over, oversimplify it, but at its essence, it really is an information science. And so organizing this data that really smart clinicians can make better decisions is so critical and, and necessary because the brain cannot keep comprehend and track and access so much information, which is growing every day. So again, the two problems we address, A, too much data, here in the US alone, there's over a billion encounters a year. Each encounter can have over 4,000 attributes. And collectively, that can give you a boatload uh, of healthcare data to manage. Um, it's also you know, amplified by the problem of variation in that data itself and how it's collected. There are over 4 million people documenting care. And while many of you may have heard of like Epic or Cerner or Meditech or, or Athena, there are actually over 100 other certified EHRs. And we've coined this term clinical data disorder. A simple example of that can be shown in this slide where each of these, each of these elements, which is intentionally designed to be an eye test, are all trying to document the same thing. In this case, a hemoglobin A1C measurement. But you can see they're all documented in very different ways. Part of what our system does through an automated API we call Fusion is it can take all that data, automatically map it into the proper coding system and, and vocabulary called LOINC and classify it in the right um, code system there as an HbA1c. Clearly, the past 18 months in the epidemic have put a spotlight on the criticality of clean real-time healthcare data. And there's so many compounding factors that are driving this convergence and need for real-time, trustable, interoperable data. And that really has, frankly, in a paradoxical way, amplify the importance of what we do as part of that ecosystem and, and in some ways help fuel our growth over the past year. I also wanted to share, looking outside of healthcare, um, Eric Schmidt, who, who many of you may know is the former CEO of Google and, and I believe still is on the board, but he gave a keynote at our Health Information Management System Society Conference back in 2018. And he made an observation I thought is really relevant to all businesses. And what he said was, that, that healthcare in every industry he's ever been in, in tech, really requires a second tier of data, that the primary data stores of the electronic health records have to be supplemented, not replaced, but supplemented with the second tier. And he's seen this phenomena play over and over and over again throughout his career. An example of that would be something we use every day. If you think of when we use Uber, or Lyft, or Waze, you cannot have 150 different GPS locations for Hartford, Connecticut. Similarly, in the world of healthcare, you do have over 150 definitions for congestive heart failure or for diabetes. And so how do you innovate when you have such disparate data? By having a single source of GPS location, it allows companies like Waze and Uber and Lyft and others to innovate because they know that data is consistent and can be leveraged, whether it's an iOS or an Android or another device. Machine algorithms work great on superbly clearing data. But in healthcare, as you can see on the right, you know, almost 80% of allergies aren't coded and, and almost 30% have no codes at all, or 70% of lab results don't use the right vocabulary. 
So when you're trying to do AI and machine learning and all this uh, advanced analytics, you have to go back to the foundational quality of data that's feeding these algorithms. That's where diameter comes in. And we've really positioned ourselves as that refinery. We have this non-carbon friendly analogy of crude oil. We think of all this clinical data as digital crude oil, but it's still crude in many respects. It's, it's in the ground, it's in tanks, it's on trucks, uh, and it's often siloed. And so we think of vendors that aggregate this data as the pipe vendors, and we don't, tip, we don't do that. We think of the use cases as the engines, uh, but you can't put crude oil in an engine, whether it's a moped or a Ferrari or an F-16. And therefore diameter is so critical, that critical middleware to be the refinery to turn that, that digital crude oil, if you will, into high octane fuel. And to do that, we built this API we call Fusion. Uh, it's powered by what we've come to call our nerds. Uh, we kind of stumbled upon that acronym, but essentially there are five things we do in that we normalize, enrich, reorganize, deduplicate, and then summarize clinical data. And in doing so, we can support a number of different use cases through software modules, which are shown uh, around that core API fusion um, to look at data quality and risk and quality measures, and then a new technology called FHIR uh, to send that data out in a standard format. So not to go too deep into our, our business um, products specifically, but just to give you a visual, we take this disparate data, and the first thing we do is we unpack things like problems, labs, meds, vital signs, and then we move them down this virtual assembly line where we have targeted natural language processing, over 100 steps to normalize that data, and then we grade each element and each document in its entirety in two dimensions from zero to 100% for its completeness and its syntax. And we don't create any content, but we map to the national content resources for labs, meds, problems, et cetera, and then ultimately package all that up and truly turn those discrete parts into a strategic asset. And as we talked about earlier, when you think about high risk patients, high cost patients that see different specialists in different environments, often in different electronic health records over the course of a year, by working with aggregators like health information exchanges and others, they can aggregate all that data and then we can run it through our Fusion API so that we can unify, normalize and put that data out. And it's really being that, that, that refinery has allowed us to evolve into multiple markets. While we started out in the upper right with the health exchanges, um, we went after that market first, not because it was a big or growing market, it wasn't, but we went there first because it had a, a wide swath of clinical data. And we really wanted to cut our teeth on every certified EHR, not just the ones that people have heard of. And in doing so, we got that scar tissue and that experience that allowed us to expand into the health plan, the payer market, and we have contracts now with Centene, uh, HCSC in Chicago, United, Optum, and, and, and others. This past year also highlighted and accelerated the life insurance and reinsurance market for uh, their desire to have clinical data, because in a world where people cannot go into a healthcare setting or a hospital and pull charts, people still wanted and needed to get um, life insurance underwriting, and much of that data can be done much efficiently with clinical data if it's normalized and cleaned up. We've also been very honored to serve our VA in looking at data quality. Uh, and this past year, we actually teamed up with Optum Insight to work with them to, to basically build and deploy in less than 35 days the entire data surveillance system for the state of California to look at every COVID lab test throughout the entire state of 40 million people that ran through our system. And we're really proud to uh, have done that and to continue to do that for the state of California. I touched on HIEs. Uh, and then we're also excited about some of the healthcare IT partnership vendors that we're working with and, and excited to continue to build relationships with. So just a few more slides. I call this the scar tissue slide of diameter, but today we've now worked with over 100 different EHR vendors, over 3,000 different instances of them. Um, it's a kind of humbling to think that through our, our direct or indirect client relationships, we've now touched over 100 million lives, almost a third of the population. Um, and we've really proud to, to continue to build a scalable certified technology platform. I think it would be um, inappropriate to not just reflect on, on this past year. And I can tell you all with great humility that I was having very different conversations with my board literally a year ago today. Um, there was so much uncertainty in the market. What did this mean? What, 
you know, we had deals that were in red line that just pencils went down, pens went down, and we weren't planning to go out and raise capital. Uh, and we weren't sure if we did what the market would respond in this, you know, unprecedented time in our lifetimes. But nonetheless, we did that. We actually found tremendous interest and appreciation for what we did and increased our exposure. We were fortunate to have received a number of term sheets and we're really excited to have, as I mentioned, closed around in September that was led by Centene and had participation again from all of our board directors um, and our, our syndicate of investors. Uh, it allowed us to actually exceed our plan, not knowing there would be a pandemic and, and double year over year revenue um, for reasons that we did with California, with Swiss Re, which is the largest reinsurance company in Zurich. We, we did a significant partnership with them and other national health plan. And most of all, it allowed us to really go out and build uh, an incredible team with incredibly talented people that I'm truly honored to work with every day and, and learn from every day. Uh, and not just the team of operators, but also expanded our board of directors with some very well-respected members of our board. So our history and frankly, our growth going forward has really been defined with a simple principle of following the data. We started with HIEs, as I mentioned, because they had a lot of data from a lot of different sources. From that, we expanded into payers, to life insurance, to other HIT vendors, but we certainly see great opportunity to continue to expand and serve multiple markets with our Fusion API. Uh, and really one of the biggest markets that we've yet to go into is the life science and the pharma market. So we do anticipate to break into that market in the second half of this year. This just gives a, a representation geographically of our footprint and where we have uh, direct and indirect relationships today through our client base. And I'll conclude with just um, my final book recommendation, or maybe no, I have two. Um, but during our customer summit, um, one of my themes was uh, around the Tom Wolf book, The Right Stuff, which, which I love. And, and again, another great book if you haven't read it. But one of the quotes that he said in that book, which always resonated with me, was that the best pilots fly more than the others. And that's why they're the best. And I think getting that scar tissue of working with hundreds of millions of records way back when it was unsexy with a small market is part of the X factor that allowed us to be where we are today. And the book also focused specifically on General Chuck Yeager, who, who many of you may know passed away this past year, um, but he was a remarkable tough as nails test pilot. And he had this saying about pushing the envelope, uh, even though he's a man of few words, he talked about pushing the envelope. And, and that's really the term that he and test pilots used about going or attempting to go beyond the limits of what was known to be possible, but then having the right stuff to keep control and composure and to bring an out of control situation back into control. But he also said that just before you break through the sound barrier, he was the first person to break through the sound barrier, the fastest man alive at the time, is when the cockpit shakes the most. And so I often remind myself and my team that because there are a lot of dark, dark days and, and uncertain times um, that happen with any journey. And, and I often think of that cockpit shaking before we bust, bust through that sound barrier. So this is again, just a visual of how we've grown over time, both by clients and by FTEs, but the theme and the North Star has always been around strategy, the right talent, um, the right product for the right market and focusing on you know, being capital efficient in our margins. So the last two slides I just wanna to touch on, which really are about the team. This is a team sport we never could have gotten here. And also recognizing what got us to this point may not be all the skill sets and frankly, even all the team members needed to bring us to the next level. So I think we've done a good job of attracting and also retaining the right talent and the right culture to allow us to continue to do that. So my last book recommendation is another great book, which um, was written by Ben Horowitz. It came out of a blog that he wrote, but it's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And there's so many quotes that I love in the book, but one of them is simply, one of the great things about building a tech company is the amazing people you can hire. And with that, it's just been a blast and an honor to uh, have built out this amazing team of people all over the country um, that, that share our vision and support our vision. Uh, and so with that, I will leave you with uh, the final quote, and that is by Steve Jobs, who, who once said, if you're working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. So with that, I, uh, I think I kept within my time limit. I'll go into separation and uh, Alan, and I'll, I'll open up if there are any questions. I'll say, first of all, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for sharing your journal 
uh, journey with us and for a very informative and interesting talk. I know I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did as well. So I'll now open it up for questions and as moderator, I'll start with the first one. Could you talk a little bit, Eric, about the competition you face and how you monitor it and how much time it takes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and sometimes, I mean, whenever, asks, whenever any, someone asks me about competition, I'm, I'm often reminded that often the biggest competition is no decision or status quo. But having said that, you know, this world of interoperability is used so broadly. And, and I think it's hard to clarify what do we do that differentiates us from our competitors. And some of that goes back to, you know, talking about the nerds that some people might parse data or, or put it back together, but that doesn't really do semantic interoperability. In terms of how we keep track of the market, um, certainly there, there are times where you're, you're in competitive situations where you can find out who the other vendors are. Um, there are industry reports, there are win-loss analysis that, that we would do um, in every deal. Uh, but we also have, are building out um, a really strong strategy team and marketing team and talking to industry analysts and other vendors and partners out there. Uh, I think the good thing about competition is we're all raising the bar and, and you know, we've also had, you know, in some cases deals where it went to another vendor because they were, they were cheaper, but I always believe people get what you pay for. And oftentimes within a year or two, they'll appreciate that they didn't get what they really need and they'll come back. Thanks. So the first question from the audience is, uh, healthcare personnel for a long time have complained about the number of EHRs and yet the healthcare providers continue to use to use them. So why hasn't there been a consolidation to reduce the number of EHRs? Yeah, I share the pain and having worked at Hartford Hospital for a number of years, uh, you know, I think that the challenge with the HRs, and I agree with the comment, and it's certainly one of the top attributions of physician burnout is EHRs. And even our own experience going to see a doctor, you want to be able to look at them and not have them looking at a keyboard. Mm -hmm. What I would say in the case of health systems and hospitals, these are generational decisions. Um, I will say there is, a, even though I said the market's fragmented, which it is, at least here in Connecticut, Epic has pretty much every inpatient EHR of every hospital in the country now. And, and over 50% of the hospitals I think are now in Epic by themselves. Um, and they certainly have a vast majority of, of ambulatory as well. But when you're spending in many cases, several hundreds of millions of dollars to, to license and to implement them, it's not like you can rip and replace every five or 10 or even 20 years. So part of the answer I think is the decisions that have been made are commitments like a marriage that aren't easy to break out of um, in the short term. Interoperability is intended to drive that and you know, information blocking is, is now some of the rules that have come out of the past administration are driving much better sharing of information, but we still have a long way to go. Do you know offhand what percent of the market Epic has? I think they have, don't hold me to this, but I think 50% um, of the US market I think is Epic today. So they're the big gorilla. Yeah, so and the they're privately held. And I will give their founder, Judy Faulkner, great credit for her discipline in essentially building everything that they have internally. So unlike other vendors, including my own experience mm -hmm. at Eclipsis, where they acquired many, many companies over years, I can remember being at big demos where they'd fly in 13 different people, each to kind of demo their piece of the solution, whereas Epic has always been lauded for an integrated platform. So the next question is, how is it that some don't see medical data as big data? Yeah, I think there's some academics that might think big data has to be even more than the 10 million or 1 million. But if it's you, I mean, you know, people often say, well, why can't medical data be like when I go and use my ATM card at an ATM machine? You know, I would say the analogy of EMRs to ATM, you wouldn't do like your, your long range financial planning at an ATM machine. And in many respects, EHRs are more transactional systems that are evolving into be more you know, decision support systems. But there's, as I said, millions of permutations with clinical data, whereas in finance, there's probably less than 50 critical parameters that need to be interchanged, which is why we can use our ATM cards anywhere in the world. Not so much the case with our medical records today. Okay, the next question is, aside from uh, pharmaceutical and life science, which you showed in your chart, are there any longer term 
potential new directions for diameter. Yeah, I mean, we want to be careful. We don't try and boil the ocean. And even I would expect some people might push back and challenge where well, you are you focused if you're going after all these other market segments. And I think on the surface, one might say no, but the only reason we've been able to do so and we're confident we can continue to do so is that we're not creating new software for each market. We're focused on that core refinery, if you will. Um, I do think ingraining that social determinants of health, um, all the information that comes off of Apple Watches and Fitbits and devices that we wear and wearables is another opportunity. But frankly, if we were to be successful in penetrating pharma and life science, that market alone and the opportunities for real world evidence and virtual clinical trials and cohort selections, things like that, far eclipses all the other markets we've been in to date combined. Okay. So I want to ask a difficult question. Uh, everyone knows we've been in a very heated market for technology and healthcare, and a lot of people fear we'll do for a correction, which we may have seen the beginning of in the last few days. How do you as a CEO and your board decide whether to stay private and grow the company or sell or go public? Yeah, no, that's um, an interesting question. You know, I'm reminded by something I actually heard Annie Lamont from Oak say at, at a conference that many of us have probably heard her say the same thing. But when she was asked a question once about, you know, whether the Republicans, or the Democrats end up coming in, like her answer was so accurate and spot on. And that was healthcare is so foundationally important and necessary. And we look at the demographics. I think this company, I know it may sound corny, but we're founded to make a difference, to put a dent in this universe. And while we certainly have taken $30 million of other people's money, that's a consideration in terms of return and timing. And we talk about that at the board, but I truly feel like we're just getting going and we're just getting the team in place. And whether there's a market correction or not, what we're doing is so critically necessary that I believe the market will value a transform transformational company, even in a down market. But I don't think we're going to be hasty to try and do something because capital gains taxes might change or, or other factors going forward. At least that's my view. I can't speak for all of my investors. Okay, thanks. So the next question is, you said you've touched 100 million people, which is about a third of the US population. Given how big that is, how large is your addressable market and expansion opportunities? I think yeah. you just hit on some of that. Yeah, we touched on some of that. I, I think I wouldn't necessarily measure it by number of, of belly buttons, as we say in the care of healthcare, unique IDs of people, but, um, but the impact of the data serving those individuals multiple times. Today, there are a lot of inefficient processes like chart pulling, where payers will pay third-party companies $20, $30, $50 or more to go in and do a physical chart pull. And they'll pay for it multiple times for the same patient because they don't even know that one division asked for the same data that another division did. And so I think when you think about the way we can liberate and liquefy the data for things like real world evidence and, and clinical trials, that's really exciting. And I think that's the much bigger market opportunity. Okay. So you were at Hartford Hospital for a long time. What motivated you to leave and start your own company? And how difficult was the transition? Well, you know, I have to give credit to my colleague, Joe Adam. We both had, you know, talked about what's the right way to scale this company. And we decided that he would go full time first and I would go, you know, help support things and work nights and weekends. And we both said every time we took a risk and, and, and were more aggressive and is when we accelerated the company growth that much more. And I always knew I could go back and get a, a job somewhere if it didn't work out. But what really motivated me was my belief in building a, a great company with, with Joe. And, and I knew myself well enough to know that if I didn't go for it, I'd regret it later. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, does Diameter collect non-EHR data that could be useful for patient analytics? Yeah, great question. I, I actually didn't go deep into all the forms of data we collect, but we do collect in addition to clinical data uh, in the form of what are called continuity of care documents, different versions of HL7 and other formats. We also collect um, claims data uh, as well. And so really marrying what was historically more claims driven analytics with clinical analytics is what makes Diameter, I, I think, uniquely positioned. 
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. If anyone has any, can you please type it? In the meantime, I'll ask one. I could be incorrect in this, but in premise, I thought your board was mostly financial people and investors and your current board, you have a lot more corporate types. Have you seen a difference in terms of the value added to the boards and the way the boards operate? Um, I'm not sure we could say I saw a difference. I saw a difference in access and that it's interesting that we have on our board now, United Healthcare and Optum on one side of the table and on the other, we have a competitor to them in the form of Centene. So in some ways my cap table could look a little bit like a dumbbell, but I think that's actually a really good balance um, and validation. Um, I also, as much as VCs vet lots of companies and only select a few, we've tried to actually be fairly within our realm, discriminating in terms of who we wanted to work with and do we think that those folks were the right partners uh, and shared our vision as well as getting a return, really making a difference in healthcare. So I think that part of our board has been a real pleasure to, to continue to work with. Okay. Are there any more questions from uh, the participants in the audience? If not, I have one last question for you, Eric. I do see uh, one question, Alan, that may not have come across, but it was just you know asking for the other, the two companies you were involved with, did you initially bootstrap and show market traction before raising capital? I think that's a great question. Uh, the answer to that question is yes and yes. And while it's a lot but, harder, I think if you can do it that way, it's just the right way to do it. Um, certain companies, you need to go fast, but we really wanted to make sure we had a viable business model as evidenced by people writing a check, even if it's a small check to start um, and then go raise capital. So I will say we did that, yeah. Okay, thanks for that insight. Uh, so my last question is, after diameter, do you think you have a third company in you? Um, you know, never say never. I'm not sure I'd want to do from zero to one again, but you never know. But um, I hope the experience I'm getting, the network I'm building, and the team that I've worked with will definitely allow me to continue to stay active in this space. So, um, but never say never. Okay, I see some people uh, have asked some additional questions. Uh, for both companies you founded, did you initially uh, that you saw that already? Yeah. Uh, what are the technology and marketing challenges still ahead for Diameter? If you were to make a strategic acquisition or two, what would you be looking for? Yeah, great question. And we do think about and look at opportunities for sort of non-organic growth. I think things that can accelerate how we can deploy our solution, either by partnerships with what I call the pipe vendors to get more data faster. Uh, and often case, you know, we have this thing, if you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. If you've seen one EHR feed, you've seen one EHR feed. Um, so things that can accelerate how we can map data, some of which sometimes has to be done manually, um, we think those would be good creative um, acquisition uh, or partnerships. Uh, and also on the bigger market opportunities where we're being looked at as tuck-ins to bigger opportunities whether it be private equity or other strategics. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, how did COVID it's, uh, impact your strategy, if at all? And do you think it will continue to impact you going forward? Yeah, so at first, I think it stopped everything. I think in time, people realize that meeting like we are today on Zoom is in many ways even more efficient than traditional meetings. So it, it actually accelerated our ability to get meetings with investors, with with prospects, with current clients that we could look at broadening value propositions together. Um, and as I said, at a macro level, it highlighted the need and the gaps in having clean, accessible, real-time data to make decisions. So I don't think we're ever gonna go back to a pre-COVID world. I think it'll be more of a hybrid, but I think what happened these past 18 months have accelerated us by over a decade in terms of readiness to do telehealth and and to appreciate clean clinical data. Okay, so I guess the last question is, are your growth decisions driven more by financial analysis or market trends? Um, I'd say more market opportunity and you know, being always balancing growth with scale. And you know, we have a big theme this, this first half of the year we call fortify and focus. And so while we're growing significantly, we also wanna make sure we're putting in 
the processes, the team, the leadership, and the people to, to do that. For example, we formalized a, a client success organization, a partner success, a program management office. We've added to our engineering team, adopting technologies like Kubernetes that would allow us to deploy our solution today. It's hosted in Amazon Web Services, but could be hosted in Microsoft or Google Cloud. So all of these infrastructure investments are critical to make sure we can scale even faster as we come out of 2021. Okay. So I think that concludes the q and I'd like to thank you again, Eric, for a terrific talk and for your very insightful answers to a bunch of tough questions. And we wish you all the success in the world. Uh, Gurgana, do you have any final comments? Thank you, Eric. Um, I think this was a great program. And um, I think folks were wondering if maybe you would be willing to share the slides. Yeah, I can pull together like a, a PDF of, of that and get that to you. And I also, I probably, if people had follow up questions, um, I probably should have put this up earlier too, but feel free either through Kurgana uh, to email me uh, as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Have Great. a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.